Yep. Well, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Coble. I'm a non-active, as opposed to a retired air marshal, and I'm also a visiting professor at the School of Security Studies at King's College London. Uh, welcome to the first of hopefully many joint Crime Valley and Association uh, Freeman Air and Space Institute webinars. Uh, absolutely delighted that so many people have signed up. Uh, if we get everyone on board, we shall be very close to 300, which is a record for FASI, uh, reflecting, of course, the importance of the topic, UK combat air now and in the future. Now, on the rules of engagement, we are on the record, so it's repeatable and attributable. And we will use the Q&A function for all questions, please. Now, I'm sure all would agree that the world is a dangerous place. At least in the West, nations are divided internally. Extreme politics are re-emerging. And I would argue that trust in politics and politicians is at an all-time low. Flashpoints around the world, most notably, of course, in Ukraine, where the risk of overspill into NATO territory is significant, especially as the war drags on. Uh, deterrence for too long, interesting word, isn't it, deterrence, uh, for too long a forgotten or perhaps perceived irrelevant concept is firmly back on the agenda, not least as even a cursory examination of NATO's posture reveals serious gaps in the rungs and the ladder of escalation, and as a time when deterrence is far more complex and multifaceted than it was in the Cold War, allowing for even greater exploitation of capability gaps. Now, I say Cold War, but do I mean the old one rather than the one we are engaged in now? Well, uh, you know, views differ on this, but increasingly I find myself driven towards the views of Sir David Omand, who argues that giving it such a title risks complacency, a mistaken belief that as with the era of mutually assured destruction, we would sit glowering at each other in what could best be described, and not for the first time in history, as a phony war. Of course, today's situation is far more nuanced than, the, 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 than that, consisting not only of greater political complexity, but also engagements across new domains. Now, in, in all of this, combat air emerges as a key player, both in deterrence and, as we've seen in Ukraine, as a decisive factor in war fighting. And combat air itself has new dimensions as the integration with missile defenses, use of unmanned systems and space capabilities increase in relevance. In our opening talks, we will hear about current and future plans for the UK as we balance investment, training and support across Typhoon, F-35 Lightning, Protector, that of course is the new unmanned system, and Tempest, a typhoon, and of course more successor in the 2035 timeframe. But a key question is how well prepared are we right now? If NATO were challenged next year and Article 5 invoked, what do we in the UK have to contribute to the party? At the end of the Cold War, the UK had nearly 50 combat squadrons. Now we could at best field six full typhoon squadrons, two F-35 squadrons, plus the remains of the Reaper and a few protector unmanned systems. Well, you know, of course, more F-35s are in the pipeline, but not as many as originally deemed essential. And which variant should we be buying? Or the Stovall B variant, or a mix to include the longer range, greater payload A version? But is that possible in a meaningful time timeline? Now, I should say, actually, we don't want to get hung up on numbers uh, in this uh, particular webinar. There'll be more time for that after the defence review is complete in a couple of years. Well, should we perhaps, like some nations, refocus on a batch five, a more capable typhoon, or indeed, are there cheaper off-the-shelf options to achieve a greater capability in a shorter time scale? But even if there were, could we recruit and train enough pilots to man them? Well, perhaps we should be building up a higher readiness of reserve air crew to deal with the surge in requirement. And going back to the key principles identified by Dowding, do we have a robust integrated air and missile defense system, IAMD, or are we now and for the foreseeable future dependent on others to provide the umbrella essential to prosecute an air war? Well, quite a lot to think about, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as those involved in the current defense review have no doubt finding. 
But fear not, folks, we have a veritable galaxy of stars to guide us through these complex issues. My co-chair, Dr. Sophie Antrobus, a research fellow at FASI, the Freeman Air and Space Institute. Air Vice Marshal Jim Beck, who's the Director, Capabilities and Programs of the Royal Air Force. Sir Brian Burridge, amongst other things, a doctoral researcher at the University of Reading. And last but certainly not least, Sir Stuart Arthur, who was Director of Training Strategy at BAE Systems, but also head of the UK's NATO Industrial Advisory Group. So, first of all, uh, let's, what is Fazi doing at the moment? Sophie, over to you. Thanks, Chris. Um, good to see so many people joining us today. Uh, and thank you for that introduction. Yeah, so welcome uh, from the Freeman Air and Space Institute. We're delighted to be hosting this um, event, first event with the Cranwellian Association. Uh, um, many of you do know um, our organisation, but since we've got a pretty large audience today, I'll just uh, reinforce a bit about what we do here at the Freeman Air and Space Institute. And I'm a research fellow, as you can see from the caption behind me. We sit in the School of Security Studies at King's College London, um, and we have members both in the Defence Studies Department at Shrivenham at the Staff College and the Department of War Studies in Central London at the Strand Campus. And we carry out independent research on and analysis of air and space power issues. We seek to inform debate uh, through publications, events, and dialogue with government, industry, and academia. Uh, sometimes that's behind closed doors, other times as now uh, in a much more public forum. But also importantly, really importantly to us, is developing uh, the next generation of air and space thinkers. That really is very much part of our mission. We're a small crowd or, or team in the UK, and we have several PhD candidates who we hope will um, be the future of uh, thinking in academia on air and space. And um, um, mentioning that, uh, some, some things that we've been doing recently, we published a paper earlier this year. This was by Professor Alessio Patellano and also visiting Professor Peter Watkins, who I think is on, on, the, um, on this uh, event today online. And they wrote about building a GCAP generation, examining past long-term intergovernmental aircraft programmes and making recommendations for the GCAP initiative, um, developing a community of practice within member countries. So there's some live issues um, in the publications that come uh, out of the Institute. Um, certainly, we, I think we might we'll certainly be talking about GPAC. GCAP and particularly it would be interesting if we do touch on the implications in diplomatic terms if um, the SDR threatens GCAP in some way. Um, now, of course, we're busy at Freeman talking about the Strategic Defence Review. Uh, the School of Security Studies at King's is submitting uh, that are thinking on uh, where the SDR should or could or shouldn't go. And as many of you, probably most of you on this call are involved with some organisation that's planning to submit, uh, we're busy talking with other organisations. We're also taking part with government in red team events and uh, in the future review and challenge process. Um, I, I was at a, a workshop yesterday, in fact, and somebody quoted the management consultant Peter Drucker, and I thought his quote was really pertinent to where we are right now. Strategy is not about forecasting the future and its attendant pressures. Rather, it is about understanding the future implications of today's decisions. I think very much the point of today's discussions. Other things that we're doing are working um, with uh, newly elected MPs, um, doing workshop on defence and security issues. Uh, some MPs have had very little contact with the defence and security agenda, uh, despite the fact, of course, um, that we know that security of the nation is the first and most important role of government. Uh, and I would drop in here now, you know, the understanding not only of what NATO Article 5 means, but, for example, Article 3 are important elements of that sort of understanding. And personally, I'm working uh, on a paper I'm co-authoring with Dr. Julia Moravska, who's a visiting senior fellow with us on integrated air and missile defence, of which, of course, combat air is a critical element. Um, as it is in deterrence, as Chris has mentioned. Finally, just a couple of um, adverts from us. Uh, do please visit our website. Not only can you find um, Alessio and Peter's paper on GCAP, um, but we've recently published uh, a paper by Group Captain Keith Slack on utilising the information lever of power. You can also, on the front page of our website, sign up to our mailing list via the Contact Us box. Please do that. Do follow us on X straight Twitter. Uh, um, and a reminder for those of you who are 
uh, able to, we are holding our Chief of the Air Staff annual lecture on the 25th of November. That will be both in person and online. So do sign, keep an eye out for um, openings of sign-ups for that. And as Chris said, do post your questions in the Q&A. Uh, you've seen a message there up from Georgina Lu Lucas. Georgie is our new senior comms officer for any of you that did um, know Orla. Uh, she's left us for Australia uh, and, and a new life there. And Georgie is uh, our, our new uh, comms officer and she's very welcome uh, into the team. Right, with further ado, um, I will hand back over to Chris to manage the discussion uh, first with our three panellists and then we'll be going forward with Q&A, which uh, I'll come back into them. Sophie, thanks very much. And uh, I, I know that people are still joining and uh, we'll have a, a discussion later about why it's taken so long to get people on board. And I'm sorry if uh, there's some, uh, there's some uh, difficulty joining. Uh, for those people who didn't get my introduction, I have no intention of repeating it, but just to mention that we are on the record and please do uh, do use uh, the Q&A. Uh, and... Um, all, all the uh, uh, all of our panelists will be delighted to answer questions from uh, your Q and A. Uh, numbers still going up, but we will continue this uh, webinar. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Vice Marshal Jim Becker. Jim, this is your day job. Uh, look at this. So we'd like to know what the hell you're doing about it all. Uh, so, so, Chris, many thanks for the intro. Um, and quite a lot is the answer. I'll reiterate that we are in an SDR right now. Uh, and we have retained decision space for politicians to, to, to guide us on what their aspirations are in the future and what resource they wish to underpin it. So at no point am I going to pen that SDR in this particular one. So please forgive me if I if I'm a little bit thin on necessary certainty when it comes to things, for example, as jet numbers. But I will give you the programme a record. Um, what I will say about the SDR, though, is we are driving a series of essays in. Uh, and for us, it is threat based. And when you look at that threat, you've got China and you've got Russia. And actually, in terms of capabilities, they are broadly similar in, in their understanding of A to AD. And in its simplest sense, it is developing systems which just push you away and keep you out of the fight. And it's very, very difficult to, to, to overcome. Um, on the record, at Unclass, the ranges we're dealing with are circa 500 nautical miles today. And by 2030, that will be a, a thousand nautical miles. And you need capabilities to be able to penetrate that to one, affect the adversary, but more importantly, have the capabilities to deter the adversary, which is the space we're in, particularly with Russia at the moment. What that leads us to conclude into the SDRSR is there is an enduring need for combat air and capabilities that can get in and, and affect. So this is not a ground versus ground debate. Air is a meaningful contribution for a significant time. Of the program of record, the backbone for what we're delivering would be our fourth gen typhoons. Uh, they are, we'll go through block four with ECRS uh, into tranche three radars. Um, and that will, that will give that an incredible capability, um, particularly in the air to air jamming and uh, the air to surface jamming, which helps us penetrate into those A to AD scenarios. Again, the program of record is our JCA requirement, which is 48 jets, which is going to deliver the land and maritime capabilities to, to meet what the carrier strike group required. Um, from previous SDSRs, uh, we expanded that number um, up to 74 jets so that we could meet the whole life of the carrier. And the carrier's got about 50 years of life, which will take us out to 2069 and F-35Bs or enough F-35Bs to, to fulfill that requirement. What I will say is our commitment to the F-35 program at the moment is 138 jets. And the difference between those 74 and up to 138 will be what we replace Typhoon for the future, but in particular, Tranche 1 Typhoon. But yet to see what that, that will look like and the outcomes will hopefully come from the, the SDR. What we're also committed to is GCAP. And GCAP is the, the principal component of a broader system of systems, which is known as EDCAS. So, and this is specifically the platform. Uh, and we are looking around about 2035 for a machine to go in and conduct operational test, OCUs in 2040, and then it develops and grows from there, which you'll see that we see a decay in typhoon numbers. 
and we see GCAT, which is very much a sixth generation capability. And it's important we bring in that sixth gen because our anticipated capabilities of the threat are growing at the same rate. Um, from an SDR proposition, what I will go on record to say is kind of the chief's priorities. And firstly, that's people. So this isn't necessarily about metal flying in the air to, to furnish the combat air requirement. It's about getting the right people to get them in the air, and specifically engineers. Uh, we um, need to grow the number of engineers quite quickly in the next decade to fulfill the requirements, one of tranche uh, of Typhoon, F-35 as it grows into that third squadron, and then uh, the, the explosion of hopefully GCAP uh, in the 2040s. Um, in addition to that will be infrastructure, and it's not necessarily about creating super bases. It's about the ability to get out there and deploy. We call it agile combat deployment because we're pretty, fairly certain that we've got to disperse to be able to then survive to fight on the following night. And in addition, it's increasing readiness. It's understanding the pinch points of, of aircraft availability and how we can turn what we've got into a far more efficient basis. Um, then we'll look at the fight. We like to consider ourselves European leaders in that transition from fourth to fifth, because we are one of the only nations really that are, have a significant number of fifth gen that work alongside it. And through the Babelfish series of trials, we have developed concepts uh, that, that mean that our fourth and fifth work in harmony. And actually the combination of what we've termed the, the thug typhoon that can carry huge amounts of ordnance and thread a long way, and the assassin uh, 35s, I mean, they work incredibly well together. To, to really extract what we consider to be the future of warfare, it comes into, into electronic warfare. And you, you furnish a jet with a, a, a data set in it um, so it can think and see what the enemy is doing in the, the electromagnetic environment. And um, we've been through the Deep Thought series looking at how AI and machine learning can develop and accelerate that. And our PFMs used to take months to develop, and US PFMs still take months to develop. But particularly with Typhoon, we've got those months down to hours. We have an aspiration of getting that down to minutes and ideally seconds. And my predecessor always had a concept that you want a Typhoon on the wing of a Voyager, and real time it is processing new, new mission data files so that we are relevant, because that is what we see to be the future of warfare. Then comes weapons. Uh, we call it the high-low mix. Uh, and what Ukraine has, said, uh, has shown us is our stockpiles need to get bigger, and significantly so. But that's not necessarily about exquisite weapons. The, the, the high-low mix, high being things like Storm Shadow, what we would look at Spear 5, but you still need your payboard boards. You still need your weaponry. You can just throw far enough. We have them in massive volumes. And that links to our activity on ACPs which is autonomous collaborative platforms. The Americans um, call them slightly different things. Uh, I colloquially call them flying robots. Uh, and again, there's a mix. Low-cost ones that you need in the thousands, and then you, you come into a triple tier two, which are more expensive. And we're doing analysis on those at the moment to work out how they fit in with Combat Air. Historically, we ran a program called Mosquito, where we looked at the market, we looked at what we could develop, and at that point in time, it did not make financial or military sense to invest in it further because the te technology wasn't there to deliver them at a cost point that was efficient in the battle. It was made more sense to go and buy manned assets at that point in time and more of the lower cost ones. But we are constantly looking at that and we're pretty certain that by 2030, we're going to need to be back in that market as we see the industrial base improve. The next important part, synthetics. If you don't get synthetics right, that's your quickest way to lose. Our investment in Gladiator, which really does put us as world leaders, is enduring, um, is exportable, uh, and we see that's where we're going to go and win the next battle. So we'll be moving more and more, and it, this is not about flying less. This is about 90% of our high-end flying activity being rehearsed synthetically and then just enacted in the real environment. And then the first one, and uh, I will... Well, off my hat to Sir Stu, who, um, who will hopefully talk about this and expand the concept, but that is the importance of the defence industrial base, and that will feature in the SDSR. I, I use the term weaponization of the industrial base. It needs to be sovereign, and you need to explode once you grow into warfare. So we're not going to see a short, quick war 
if it's against a, a proper peer adversary, we're going to go in. We need to be able to survive and then we need to be able to thrive within it. And the industrial base will be critical to that. So, sir, that is me complete. Jim, thanks very much. I uh, picked a few things out there. Really focus on threats in the SDR, how important that is, and, and how sophisticated they are becoming, particularly in the in terms of the need to uh, uh, to increase uh, the penetration range. Uh, combat air, of course, crucial in all of this. We said we wouldn't talk about numbers, but you were kind enough to mention them and, and reassure us that there is still a, an operational requirement for 138 F-35s, although that, of course, will be considered in the SDR. And it will be, of course, next year's bit of the SDR rather than what's going on at, at the moment. Uh, very heartened to hear about the com commitment to GCAP and FCAS. And uh, stress the point, it's not just about air crew this, it's about the infrastructure, it's about engineers, it's about retaining people as well, I think, isn't it? The, uh, the, the, the challenge of retaining people in a, in a market where, you know, we're looking for the best and so is everybody else, getting them and keeping them very important. Uh, the need for increasing sophistication in our systems, the use of artificial intelligence, uh, and, uh, and of course, this getting the balance on the use of unmanned uh, in, in the future, and maybe Swarm has got a role to play in all of that. But right at the end, you you stress the, the really important bit about getting, and it was, uh, it's been mentioned before so many times, getting that link between government, industry, armed forces, uh, all tied in together in a way that perhaps we haven't done in the past. Uh, and uh, it's probably a good time then to bring in Sir Brian Burridge, uh, None of this is done in a vacuum, Brian. Uh, it's, of course, we all work in a political, very political world, a uh, world of, uh, of uh, perceived realities, if not realities. And, uh, and, and actually, you very kindly agreed to give us your thoughts on, on that backdrop uh, and also and to mention uh, a little bit about sovereignty issues, which came up uh, in Jim's talk as well. So, Brian, over to you. Thank you very much. And good morning, everybody. Let me start with uh, a topical aspect of black holes, courtesy of the Public Accounts Committee on the 4th of March this year. And I quote, This year's MOD equipment plan reveals that there is a 16.9 billion deficit between the Ministry of Defence's capability requirements and its budget, despite the MOD having increased the plan's budget by 46.3 billion. This is the largest funding deficit in any of the 12 plans the MOD has published since 2012. It is also a marked deterioration in the reported financial position since last year's plan, which the MOD judged to be affordable, but this committee concluded was not, and that is characterized by optimism bias. The real deficit, however, is even larger because some parts of the armed forces have not included costs for all the capabilities government expects the MOD to provide, but only those they can afford. The, the Army, for example, could need around $12 billion more to fund all the capabilities the government seeks. That's the sort of rhetoric that decision makers are subject to, and indeed those who apply oversight to decision makers. And it's the PNC's response to the MOD's unpublished equipment plan 2023 to 33, of which more later, but which was scrubbed by the National Audit Office. So the forthcoming Strategic Defence Review will doubtless do its work based on attempting to get a perfect balance between ends, ways and means in both future defence and security strategy. And I have to say good luck with that in the light of the prevailing economic circumstances. Almost everything I say about the future is pure conjecture, albeit informed by a few indicators and warnings from the past. Nevertheless, I think it's prudent to have a plan, but as Sir Michael Howard reminded us, and it's often quoted in the uh, Freeman Institute, not least by the Chief of the Air Staff in its address last year, no matter how clearly one thinks, it is impossible to anticipate precisely the character of conflict. The key is not to be so far off the mark that it becomes impossible to adjust once the character is revealed. A more recent philosopher of great international standing with millions of followers put it another way. Just because you made a good plan doesn't mean that's what's going to happen. That's Taylor Swift with 230 million followers. 
when it comes <clears throat> to reviewing the big ticket items like FCAS in the face of an FCR, three dimensions of relevance apply. Firstly, is it operationally relevant? Does it contribute to modern deterrence? Can it do what we need to do in a fighting war? Contributing to anti-access area denial, a problem which uh, is going to be with us uh, even in an expanded form. Now with uh, ballistic missiles, hypersonic weapons, sophisticated drones, unsophisticated drones as well. Is it optimized for that situation? Will it integrate properly? Can it be tweaked when the facts change? And that's an aspect we'll return to. Is it economically relevant? Will it distort the equipment program like a cuckoo in the nest? We hear siren voices talking about exquisite technology, and as a former airman, I'm often lambasted by that term. But a secondary consideration also is um, what are the implications for the broader economy? such as on defense industrial strategy. Finally, is it politically relevant in terms of ministerial risk appetite? In determining an air commander's targeting directive, do we know enough about the way in which the algorithms work to give certainty on aspects such as collateral damage and crew survivability? Ministers take that responsibility very seriously. So with this in mind, let's return to the ends, ways, and means and conjecture about what the future might hold by looking at some of the lessons from the past. First, the ends of military strategy objectives that support national brand strategy. The four preceding SDRs, 1998 under Labour, 2010 under the Conservative Liberal Coalition, in a period of deep defence austerity, 2015 and 2021 under the Conservatives, both of which sought to redress the limitation, some would call it damage, that was done in 2010. But they all had much in common in terms of strategic objectives. In 98, Britain's place in the world, I remember uh, the um, place of Lord Robertson in both the 1998 and the 2025 SDR. Britain's place in the world is determined by our interests as a nation and as a leading member of the international community, as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, and as a country both willing and able to play a leading role internationally, we have a responsibility to act as a force for good in the world. And so the immediate post-Cold War joint rapid deployment force, which those of us in MD at the time cobbled together, became the Joint Rapid Reaction Force, the JRFF, or better, JRRF. Um, 2010, twin objectives, protecting the homeland and to shape a stable world by acting to reduce the likelihood of risks affecting the UK or our interests overseas and applying our instruments of power and influence to shape the global environment and tackle potential risks of sorts. So the JRRF became Future Force 2020. 2015 said our vision is for a secure and prosperous United Kingdom with global reach and influence. Protect our people, protect our global influence, promote our prosperity. They were the strategic objectives. So Future Force 2020 becomes Joint Force 2025. 2021, the integrated review of the Defence Command paper, um, objectives three and four, strengthening security and defence at home and overseas, and building resilience at home and overseas. So Joint Force 2025 becomes Integrated Force 2030. So a legacy of high readiness forces and a gradual decreasing mass. A sign, and combat mass counts in these situations, a sign that ends, ways, and means were not ever in balance. And somewhere along the line, it's just tempting to recall Douglas Hurd's 1993 speech. We talked about Britain punching above our weight, and uh, often referred to by fellow academics as a tired cliche. But nevertheless, it is uh, an aspect that politicians have to give uh, some thought to. Now, as to the future, the 2024 Labour Manifesto said, no policy commitment in pursuit of Labour's missions matters unless we uphold the first duty of any government to keep the country safe. 
peace and security in our land. They require constant vigilance. Over the last 14 years, geopolitical tensions have risen while the conservatives have hollowed out our armed forces. Now Putin is attempting to break European security with his full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Labour will meet this challenge by strengthening our armed forces and protecting our national security. And further, they say, and this is important given Labour's difficulties of the 1990s, our commitment to the UK nuclear deterrent is absolute. It's a vital safeguard for the UK and our NATO allies. As the party that founded NATO, we maintain our unshakable commitment to the alliance and we will apply a NATO test to major defence programmes to, sure, to ensure that we meet our obligations in full. Also, on the 2025 SDR, uh, some of you will know there's 24 propositions which um, those in this community are asked to provide illumination, if not answers to, and two are very relevant. Describe how existing UK defence capability and the current 10-year programme match the demands of the roles and capabilities identified for the era 2024 to 2040. Highlighting and prioritising critical gaps, identify areas that require urgent intent attention to ameliorate immediate strategic level risk of vulnerability, including in logistic support and medical capability lessons from Ukraine. Propose, uh, the next one that's important is, propose how the UK defence contribution to NATO should be enhanced as a driving requirement of capability and activity, including through prioritising defence export potential. So, I judge more of the same, a nuclear weapon state putting NATO first and appetite for expeditionary operations. But if they're the ends, what about the ways that such uh, a, such as the defence industrial base and the means, particularly the budget, although I personally place human capital at the same level. On the ways, the 98 Labour Party manifesto said that we support a strong UK defence industry, which is a strategic part of our industrial base as well as our defence effort. And the SDR itself in 98 enlarged on this with two supporting essays, but the, the real challenge at the time was seen as the procurement process. And so the mantra, faster, cheaper, better, was Brian, the only one who's lost Brian's sound. No, Brian. Uh, we have lost sound. Okay. Coming back on. Yeah. The problem was well identified in the defence industrial policy of that area. And that era, rather, this was written by Peter Watkins, a visiting professor here. And it's about the relationship between government, defence, and industry. The government is responsible for providing the armed forces with high quality equipment at best value for money for the taxpayer. It is also firmly committed to the UK manufacturing sector and to promoting a strong and competitive UK industrial, uh, sorry, UK defence industry, bringing economic and technological benefits to the nation. The government must take decisions within a policy framework that recognises the tensions between these two objectives. And that is fundamental. And it is the fundamental difficulty that is placed on politicians when making judgments about both equipment and suppliers. In these circumstances, seeking to create a competitive market in what is a long-term business with platforms taking a decade to develop and uh, great cost uh, in development and an in-service life of two, three decades, it absolutely cries out for a proper defence industrial strategy. And to be useful, uh, a strategy, uh, defence industrial strategy needs to cover five areas, really. Future programmes, future technology requirements, the definition of value for money, 
the approach to partnering and most significant for us today, sovereign capability. And this relates to industrial capabilities that are seen as sovereign in that their existence on shore permits unfettered access to the industrial capability and related intellectual property required to support, upgrade, and in future replace military equipment. In parallel, there is a security supply implication in building national resilience. And that really, um, when you think about the nature of uh, conflict in the future and, and the amount of time it, uh, a single uh, operation might uh, prevail, is very important. So the first DRS in recent times in 2025, uh, which, sorry, the first DIS in those times in 2005 took a very narrow view. And a lot of people have forgotten about this aspect of sovereign capability, which said, we're introducing two new highly sophisticated manned combat fast jets, Typhoon and the JCA, which are intended to last for more than 30 years. Current plans do not envisage the UK needing to design and build a future generation of manned fast jets beyond these types. However, precisely because the current fleets of the new types we're introducing are like to have a long operational life, we need to retain the ability to maintain and upgrade these types for a considerable period, so sovereign capability. But a touch of cakeism here because it demonstrates a lack of recognition of the generation and stewardship of related intellectual property as true now as it was then. In automotive terms, industries, our industry's mantra was that you need a factory, not a garage. End-to-end -end capability design, develop, manufacture, and test a fast jet aircraft relies on a cohort of about 750 specialist engineers who once lost would be hard to rebuild. And of course, Brian, thanks, for all the Brian, thanks, uh, yeah. thanks very much. Uh, uh, I picked up some, I love that expression optimism bias. We used to call it entryism, I think, didn't we? Uh, also, the, uh, the, the minister's uh, extra scrutiny, you know, how we're seeing the, that across the whole piece of, uh, of defence, extra scrutiny, particularly in terms of the algorithms and what sort of collateral damage we could expect. Uh, consistency, though, with the UK's ro role in, uh, in in the world. Uh, they, I, that, I love that uh, expression you came out with, increasing readiness but reducing capability. That's interesting. Uh, but the commitment to nuclear, which has uh, been uh, consistent in the last 20 years, but not necessarily in the 90s, uh, more of the same, ends what about the ways means, and, and something that's going to lead us in nicely to uh, Sir Stewart, and that, of course, is the need for a defence industrial strategy, the importance of IPR, retaining IPR, uh, particularly for things like upgrades, urgent operational requirements, uh, and and so on. Uh, so, Stu, I think it's a good time to hand over to you and give us the industrial perspective and, uh, and one or two things, particularly on the NATO side as well. Great. Thank you, Chris, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it, it's it's great to see the variety of people on the call, and uh, I do note that, Osby, that you're there, so I'm watching you. But I do think and agree with Chris that actually not only is this an important discussion, but it's at an important time. I, you know, it was really interesting listening to Jim and, and providing his perspective then. As always with uh, Sir Brian, it's interesting. I always use a quote that Brian Burridge used to say about, you see the world from where you sit. And I guess um, I, I, I'm going to talk from three seats. Um, you know, you, you can't shake off your 35 years in the Air Force, whether you're retired or less active or whatever the phrase is, Chris, there. And, and, and clearly much of my view is shaped by that. But it has been interesting to step inside industry and you look at common issues, but the perspective is different. And I know that my own perspective has developed and is informed by that. And so this you know, current job that I have hopefully will helpfully add to the perspective I had from the Air Force. And I'm glad you mentioned the third one. And I do think that a, a NATO perspective overlaid on a national perspective is really important in this, not least because we've got a government who in its first week in power was out in Washington in force and has put out that it's a NATO first defence policy. What does that mean? 
How does that translate? And how does that matter to a discussion about combat air, what you need now and what's next? Um, my start point is, you know, there is a framework for this conversation that we have already established. And that's the framework that was laid out in the combat air strategy of 2018. Now, at the time when that came out, 2018 was the 100th year of the Air Force. And it was an opportunity for the Air Force to reflect on what it done in the past and what it wanted to be in the future. But it wasn't just about the Air Force. It was about that relationship between government, industry and the Air Force. And I think as we look at the question in front of us, it's worthwhile just reflecting on that national value framework and then testing the words of the strategy then against events and experiences subsequently to work out where is it's relevant and where it's not, where have we fallen short and where have we not. And I suppose my opening and perhaps you know deduction would be it's still relevant, it still matters, and we should use it as our framework. And in many ways, as uh, Sir Brian was going through his commentary, I was kind of ticking off the national value framework. You could say three elements to it. One, about what's the capability that we need. And again, 2018, I think it's really important for us to think about what the world was like at that point. You know, 2014, the world changed in many ways. You know, we had a conservative government going into its second SDSR and it started with a small hand in the tiller because 2010 was when the big moves were made. You know, that was when, you know, we they, they kind of laid out their stall. However, events in Ukraine, and to an extent with Daesh and ISIS and the rise of that actually caused 2015, I think, one of the most fundamental changes in ambition for defence. And the headline for all militaries and for us as the Air Force at the time in my job as operational delivery was about, no longer was it about chasing men in bad hats. This was warfighting at scale, near peer adversary, Article 5. And I would argue that head mark laid there, which then set the conditions for the combat air strategy, to an extent was not necessarily followed through. And it's taken the event since February of 2022, perhaps to bring to life what the things that we have not do, done. So back to the combat air uh, strategy. So what's the capability that we need? What is the industrial dimension? Brian, you have covered this so well, but I will try and echo and emphasize a couple of the points. Prosperity, prosperity and security are two sides of the national interest coin. And I think there's an element here that when you're in the military, when you're doing Jim's job, it's very interesting because it's how you spend the money. Moving into industry is a really interesting thing to add, not only how you spend, but how you make money. And I think that sort of sense brings maybe a slightly different perspective. And again, I'll come back to perhaps, you know, issues like export. But I think the third part of the combat air strategy that's sometimes forgotten is about international influence. We wanted a nation that is strong, that is prosperous, and continues to influence, whether it's about the Security Council, whatever that role. And combat air is an opportunity for us to influence the world. We have competitive advantage when it comes to combat air that that strategy can then exploit but that was 2018. The world moves on. Some of us leave the Air Force and, uh, you know, events and new governments and all of that. So here we are in 2024. How relevant is it? And I guess I would point to three things. Um, one, um, COVID, cost of living crisis. You know, that, 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 that challenge that we have, we have a, a government that's come in and it said economic growth. That is how we're going to fund the plan. That is how we're going to fill the black hole that Brian saw. OK, so we've got an economic challenge. I think closer to our bar is China. Because after the SDSR 2015, David Cameron was still having a pint of beer with the Chinese president just down the road from High Wycombe. 
You know, it was quite a different world in many senses as we were looking at the threats. And that threat, as we know, has only intensified. And so the Chinese dimension, but of course, it's Ukraine. And what is it about Ukraine? Look through the lens of Ukraine at combat air. And what do we take from that? I, I am always suspicious of anyone that starts with a lesson from Ukraine, because invariably you then go into a particular hobby horse or not. But I feel I'm in confident ground because I'm going to echo the chief of the air staff and, and the language that he uses. And indeed, some of the language that we've used. And I think there are four parts of the Ukrainian experience that is absolutely relevant to a combat air conversation. The, the first one is about operational advantage and control of the air. And the consequences for how a war is conducted if you do not have that, whether it's about the whole attritional warfare we talk about or stalemate or stasis or however we need, that discussion about control of the air, which frankly had, had withered on the vine. You know, the old fighter pilots like you, Chris, were pretty redundant for much of the last two or three decades in people's minds. The events in Ukraine has absolutely fundamentally underpinned the importance of control of the air. I guess the second thing is the critical importance of deterrence. And I would say, you know, our, our Navy colleagues on nuclear, you know, they, they perhaps are better read on deterrence. We as airmen and particularly combat air was more about coercion, but deterrence is back. And what Ukraine shows us is the cost and blood and treasure when deterrence fails, and therefore there's a premium to be paid in peacetime, so-called peacetime, for that deterrent. And deterrence has many parts. And I guess this switches into my third point, is about industry, about Jim's weaponization of industry, because he is so right, about actually one of the lessons from Ukraine is the level of risk to military plans that sits inside industry, which is neither understood visible or therefore mitigated. Where it's about production capacity, supply chain, call it what it may. But Jen Stoltenberg's comment that without industry, there is no defense, there is no deterrence, and there is no security, I think underpins the nature of that relationship between governments, armed forces, and industry. Some call what's going on in Ukraine the war of the warehouses. But it is so much more than that. And I would assert that I think that in the UK, we have another advantage there. Because I do think, I would say this, wouldn't I, that actually we have quite an intimate relationship. It's not perfect and we need to do better. But you look at things like our availability contracting and the likes of that, the confidence and the, the, the benefits of that relationship, I think, have come through. And, and the fourth and final point from a... Uh, from a Ukraine perspective, is about the rapid delivery of capability. It was really interesting looking at some of the conversations around innovation and technology and comparing it to my time as the one-star joint cap guy doing UORs. And I know there are many on the call who were involved in this when we're looking at the response to things like IEDs and what we were trying to do rapidly and how you manage risk in that period, you know, some of the, the, the quote that Brian talks about, you know, everything all, you know, about the altar of competition and actually how does that influence actually what the warfighter needs, what we as a nation needs. I think there is something that is really important, the relationship between armed forces and industry, but it's not just about industry. And I would refer to, I think, Nightworks, and we can perhaps pick this up, because I'm aware we want to get into questions, so I do want to sort of draw a full. But if I look at Nightworks, which Brian Burridge, you were CNC at the time as this was unfolding, this was this bringing together in a safe space, academic, scientists, technologists, warfighters, policymakers, experimenting, looking at actually how it is we can rapidly exploit the, uh, the technologies may have moved on. We may be focusing in slightly different areas than we were then, but it's even more important now as we look at AI and autonomy and data analytics. And finally, two things which perhaps just I'll signpost, but I'd be really keen that we come back to combat air mass and actually what does that formula looks like? And again, Jim very well, I think, laid out elements of this. 
Perhaps 20 years ago, we used to talk, oh, it's live synthetic balance because a fleet, a third of it is in use, a third's for trading, a third's for maintenance. But if you take that third out for trading and actually exploit what you can do synthetics, well, that's a way of getting more combat air mass. ACP, CCAs, whatever you call it, absolutely is going to transform, I think, the formula around combat air mass. How do we do that? What does the tier one, tier two, tier three mix looks like? And the second thing I just wanted to finish with about redness and resilience. This is not just about the redness and resilience of the armed forces. You know, some of you know that we've been engaging with Finland and Sweden about their views of total defence. A threat to all of society demands an all of society response. That sense of what industry and governments and armed forces do together. What does a ready and resilient um, industry look like? Manpower, equipment, training, support. And how confident are we that we're on the right journey? So to conclude... I would say the combat air strategy, the national value framework, whilst not perfect, is absolutely, I think, an appropriate fair. There is an imperative and an opportunity for us in the coming months for us really to drive forward the arguments. Look forward to the, uh, the question and answers. Thank you, Chris. Stuart, thanks very much. That was quite outstanding. And uh, a few points there. This important link between what we produce and security. It is so important. I have to say, when I was in the MOD, perhaps I didn't have sight of that as in, the, in the same way as you, one does afterwards, and certainly I picked up a different perspective as chairman of, uh, of Western Helicopters. You, you mentioned influence. Uh, in our deterrence paper that we mentioned earlier, the expression aura came, and the aura is the, the, the sort of sense that people have about your determination. There is something that people have an, an, a, 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 their thoughts about the Brits, and this was put to me by a, an admiral I work for. We are known as the most bloody-minded nation in the world. We'd rather pull the temple down around our own heads than go under to dictatorship. That aura is, is terribly important and is, of course, as you suggested, part of deterrence, along with the other things that you've, you've mentioned. Economic challenge, China... The importance of control in the air and all of this, and, and deterrence not just being st the strategic nuclear deterrent. It is multifaceted, more complex. It includes also, I would suggest, tactical nuclear. It's something that hasn't been mentioned yet, but actually combat air surely in the future has a role to play in all of that. Maybe, Jim, you can comment on that later. This thing that you and Brian have mentioned, the, and Jim, the importance of the weaponization of, uh, of industry. We have to retain a strong industrial base. We need a defense industrial strategy to, to uh, ensure the rapid delivery of capabilities. Uh, you, you mentioned Nightworks. I was involved in that too, and that was a tremendous uh, uh, enterprise, of getting people together. And, and really, you know, rather like the Skunk Works in the, in the USA, it actually was looking at uh, the future and the importance of STE. Great summary. And uh, and I, we've slightly overrun our time on the panel list, but that's to be expected with the people we have. So uh, I would now throw it back to Sophie. And Sophie, would you be kind enough to lead on the Q&A? Yes, happily. Um, and thank you very much for all of those contributions. Um, I, I'm, uh, well, I, th I think I've left, uh, Chris has, has summed them up well and picked out some important points. The, the one point I would make um, to... Uh, Stu's point about the critical importance of deterrence, one of the four things to take from Ukraine. Um, I think also there's that lesson, isn't there, that what the Russians aren't using because they still uh, have a, the, the, the deterrence dynamic with NATO to still consider. Um, and so that complements your point, but um, I think I think that's relevant too. So we'll move on to the Q&A. We've got a, a few questions in the Q&A um, Box, please do, uh, those of you on the call, um, enter your questions there and we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, I'll, I'll start with the top one conventionally, but I might jump around because um, I want to get as many different voices in as possible. Uh, so our first question from Geoffrey Wardle. Having worked on both manned and unmanned combat air pro programmes for the GCAP, uh, sorry, for the GCAP programme, are we looking at unmanned UCAVs? for the CIAD, suppression of enemy air defences, and counter air ops, and then the manned element for deep interdiction. Perhaps, Jim, you'd uh, start yeah. on that one. 
Um, to your answer is we're doing everything um, because you, you, can't, you, you shouldn't put one platform into a silo and that's all it can do. That is the beauty of a manned combat air asset is it doesn't just do one role. It can do so many. Um, and you take Tornado, for an example, that were, was designed to penetrate Russia. And yet it did such a sterling job in Afghanistan. So that is the benefit of a man platform. Um, for autonomous collaborative platforms, they can do absolutely everything as well. So, so we, we see the initial benefit right now of, of them having an electronic warfare capability um, and it, almost in the disposable sense because they're so affordable, you can send them in and you just cause a problem. And, and it's a numerical problem. And, and if we do the opposite of some of the debates that people have come out with e, from the, the, the missile takedowns in Yemen, that actually if we can send a few thousand pound robot in that's going to have to take a Russian SA-10 missile to hit it, we start turning the whole thing. So that's, that's the importance of actually low-end um, ACPs right now. But once you move up the tiers and we look further into the future of what the FCAS team are looking, there is so much more you can do. And actually... Um, the, the, the benefit of some of these is not necessarily risk or affordability. It's the fact that if you don't have to design a human into it, it can stay in the air a lot longer. It doesn't need an ejection function. It can fly in a piece of airspace that's very different. So again, that opens up a series of, of different roles. So in short, we are looking at everything because if you commit to one thing that ACPs do this, manned assets do that, you're probably going to miss the opportunity as things develop. Stuart. <laughs> If I can, thank you, uh, Chris. And, uh, you know, it's a really important question because I do think this is one of the areas that's really developing. It's interesting when you have these air power conferences and, you know, air forces around the world trying to get their mind around what does CCA, CP, how is it going to change that, um, you know, the, the definitions of combat air mass. And I do take my hat off to the Air Force and their ACP strategy, which is part of a drone strategy. But uh, what I would say is I mean, a couple of things uh, from my NATO perspective, when it comes to SEAD, can I recommend that people look at the study that Paul Smith is leading? Now, some of you will know Paul Smith, Mufti, uh, Typhoon guy, and, and, and uh, also be systems, but he's looking at SEAD in the 2030s and beyond. And what does that look like? What is it? What does this mix? Because you know, it, this isn't about GCAP, and I know we, we, we talk about GCAP because that is a program around the manned part of this that we're doing with Italy and with Japan. What we want to really talk about is FCAS, that future combat air system. And that includes F-35, it includes Typhoon, and it critically it includes ACPs. And I, and I noticed, Jeff, that you, in your subsequent question, you bring in Tyrannus. And I would say this, again, one of the things I've learned since joining the company and, again, building on what I know from the Air Force and now what I know is actually what we actually have inside the UK when it comes to IP skills and knowledge stuff that you know some of us that uh, looked at you know from an air force perspective some of the things B systems were doing herty and mantis and think what was that about but the knowledge and the insight those kind of programs brought and particularly tyrannis do give us a competitive advantage and i'm glad that we've actually opened with a tier three a conversation because so often I think the conversation is dominated and I understand why inappropriate with the tier one with a lot of what we are seeing in Ukraine and we need to, ability to respond to that but I think there's a plethora of capability here and I think we have comp comp uh, a, a competitive advantage nationally for us. The Air Force has got a strategy around it. We have insight and technologies and how you wrap that all together Developing the concepts and the doctrine in hand with the technologies and the iteration between the two, to my mind, is an absolute critical factor. And I welcome the 2030. I welcome what we do by then. But I absolutely welcome as we look to that longer term there and really drive a highly capable for a future combat air system of which ACPs are going to be an absolutely critical part. Thank you. Great. I think uh, that's probably enough on that one. Back to you, Sophie. Uh, fine. I'm just going. I'm going to jump on to a question um, from John Lake, uh, and his first question um, for 
uh, Jim, is about a report on a business case being made for F35As to um, to free up bees that are now being used on the OCU. Um, he specifically said, would this not be something of a Trojan horse getting F35A into service in advance of there being a natural requirement for it, and therefore potentially undermining the case for GCAP? I don't know what you can say about that. We've got a multitude of considerations going in um, right now. What we really want to do is grow the lightning force as quick as possible. Uh, so that we can fulfil the requirement of the carrier strike group FOC, which starts next year. So, so I'm not going to comment yes or no on, on that, but I say there's a multitude of um, options on the table. Of how do we enhance OCU activity? And one example will be actually, do we take more risk and invest more in the sims so that we actually can train them quicker in the synthetic environment and fly them less? So, so actually left and right are all being considered right now. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to jump on to Tim Robinson's, uh, good to see you, Tim, online. I'm assuming it's Tim. Uh, Tim Robinson, um, what do the panel think of the USAF backing away from NGAD? As we know, they've, uh, they're have they having a pause. Um, what are the implications for the UK of built to adapt rather than built to last? Do you, will you lead on that one, please? So I think you said, Stuart, so you're very happy to, because uh, it's kind of interesting, because, of course, when Frank Kendall made his original comments that uh, I think, Tim, you're reflecting on, uh, you know, people are, hang on a minute, it's exactly the language that you're using, backing away from NGAD. Subsequently, Frank Kendall has clarified, unsurprisingly, what it is that he's talking about. You know, there are a different situation in the States with uh, what Lockheed are doing, what Boeing are doing, what the US Navy are doing, what the U USAF are doing. And that sort of sense of actually taking time, you know, there, there is no doubt about the need for a sixth generation capability. In his mind, there is no doubt in the timelines that we're looking at that that will be manned in the first instance and whatever will happen along the way. So I don't think that is at all about backing away from the NGAD. But I do think you know your point about build to adapt rather than build to last is an absolutely critical point. I know I'm slightly bridging into to that other one because that's what we need in a future combat air system, that ability to adapt. Now, it's not new. Do you remember, I mean, when Brian Burridge, when you were CNC, agile, adaptable, capable, you know, that, you know, that's what we were saying, you know, at that time, that ability to adapt and, uh, you know, the quote that, uh, you know, you, 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 quote, you, you take from Michael is absolutely relevant. And so how do you design and build adaptability into that? So to my sense, as you look at competitive advantage, and I know there's another question further down that talks about where does competitive advantage come in the 2040s? You know, it's and I know, uh, Justin, you're on the call and I would say, you know, your comment at the Air Power Conference, I don't agree with, which is if it doesn't deliver a capability by 2028, then put it on the burner. There are things we need to do today, the things we need to invest today that will deliver capability in that longer run there. And that's why you need an NCAD, why you need an FCAS capability. Again, back to the opportunity that we have right now from a national perspective, that ability to deliver a military capability that is relevant, to keep an industrial base that you don't only need for future in terms of uh, future prosperity, but actually about the skills and the jobs that, that come in, we can perhaps come back to you know, that affordability, because I do think we need to have at some point a real hard-nosed conversations about budgets. But lastly, about international influence and actually what a program like GCAP is, which is an international program, which is not you know, where NGAD is. And so that bridging into a, an international partnership with Japan, you know, mm. and ask yourself a question, well, why is Washington happy for UK to have that relationship? Because you look at the threat from the Indo-Pacific and link it to the Euro-Atlantic, and you have an industrial collaboration, you have a political collaboration that spans between the two. So GCAP and AUKUS, absolutely two critical programs. So I think it's an inexact parallel to say what the discussion about NGAD is, and then linking it directly into UK GCAP conversation. And Brian Burris, there's a political context here as well, isn't there? Uh, yes, and it's actually quite tricky um, to get across the importance of it in the political environment. But 
what we're essentially talking about is the generation and stewardship of indigenous intellectual property. And taking a gap in a development program for any length of time, then the previous effort is squandered and you are way, way behind if you ever choose to go back to it. And it's significant for a nation of our size and capability, given the strength and expertise that exists in our science and technology sector. And that, that is what you take to the table when you want to uh, join a collaborative program or whatever. And if you don't have intellectual property to offer, maybe if you have very large amounts of money that can compensate, but that really is the case. But if you don't have intellectual property, you're just not in the game. Jim, I hope it's not an unfair thing to throw at you, but one of the big issues I remember with AMRAM and several other uh, capabilities that we've had in the past, and no doubt F-35 uh, uh, writ large, is this whole business of to what extent do we know what's going on you know, un uh, under the surface and to what extent can we influence and, and indeed adjust to, uh, to national requirements in an aircraft of the F-35 type capability. Do you want? Are you? Do you feel able to comment on that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're a tool. We 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 entered at the very beginning of that, uh, and we're an equitable twenty five percent partnership as we developed. So so we were intrinsic to the beginning, and we still have operational test teams out at Edwards Air Force Base right now that are intrinsic to the test and evaluation, and we we actually cover ten percent of the total test of what was the backbone of the United States Air Force Combat Air Force for the future. And you can remember F-35 is um, unhedged almost with a few F-15s being bought. And that's the first time the US have ever done it. So, so actually, that was quite a strategic deal for ourselves. So, no, I'm quite comfortable. We are, we're, we're definitely in the circle. Um, I, I'd actually just like to answer this in a subtly different way, though, that um, the US are facing China with a significant budget. But when you actually look at triple P, which is how much do, does their money, how, what can they buy with that? In China, it goes a lot further than it does with the US dollar. And it's the same when we look at Russia. Uh, and Russia have got a different one. They've got a significant GDP spent because they are in a wartime economy right now. And, and the US are in that really difficult position where they're going to have to fund full spectrum warfare and their adversary sat in a wartime economy. And the two don't balance. And, and so what you're seeing is, is an affordability issue in many ways of them saying, how do I do all of it? How do I spread it to, to cover it all? And this might be indicative of them opting to have influence across their entire defense industrial base that covers everything but but doesn't necessarily cover the depth and their view is therefore when we transition to war we can explode our defense industrial base in any direction we want rather than have it sort of unhedged and they're all going in just one direction so so there's complexities of 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 the american um industrial base, how they fund it against an adversary, which needs to be factored in when you consider any decision they make on a capability. That's very helpful. Thanks very much. Uh, Sophie, should we move on to the next question? Yeah, I mean, we've got lots and lots of questions. I'm actually going to, because you brought this up earlier, Chris, and you might actually want to start um, but with a comment on Paul Robinson's point, because you mentioned tactical nuclear and whether we might discuss it. And he says, bearing in mind Russia's tactical nuclear threats over Ukraine, um, quite pertinent with the news this week. Is there a role for reintroducing a UK theatre nuclear capability? I don't know if you want to say a couple of words on that first and see if anybody else on the panel does. Yeah, I'm sure everyone would like to have a say on that. Uh, certainly, you know, one of the things we, we often hear is that Trident uh, has got a, uh, a sub-strategic capability. Well, it might, it might have, but it's an exo-atmospheric, and I'm not sure it would be seen as a credible uh, deterrent against a tactical nuclear threat from uh, uh, from Russia. Uh, you know, the simple question, if uh, if Putin were to, were to decide that uh, the storm shadow had become such a big threat, he had to destroy the factory, and he sends a small tactical nuclear in to do it, how would we respond? You know, how would NATO respond? You know, we've uh, we, we've certainly lost a lot of those rungs in the ladder of, of, uh, of deterrence. Uh, the, the big issue is how you do it and whether it's a national capability or whether it's one that we have to depend upon the United States for. We know, I think it's certainly Germany, I think Netherlands uh, are looking at the F-35A uh, to get them up to a, a, a nuclear capability. Jim, you'll be able to comment on that. 
uh, is that a possibility for us? Could it be done in in the reasonable future? What are the other options? But when you consider that we had everything from howitzer uh, one kiloton weapons all the way up to strategic nuclear in the past, now we're left with one shot only, one big shot only. I'm left with the feeling we do need to reintroduce some sort of tactical nuclear capability to add to those important rungs in the escalatory ladder. Uh, Jim, uh, I think everyone will want to say on that, but Jim, any any comment from you on that possibility? Um, it's true, the F-35A um, has has that capability for tactical nuclear weapons. Um, uh, that's probably we need to cover on that part. I think from a defence perspective, we've come through the 90s. Um, we, we have committed strategic nukes and, and we've been fairly firm on that. But when you actually bring this conversation, it, it was one, people almost giggle when I talk about it. We, we conducted a war game and uh, in the end, people had tactical nukes and everyone sort of chuckles. But actually, we need a serious conversation. We've got, to, we've got to break down the taboo on the conversation of this so that we understand where we sit against adversaries on the nuclear escalation ladder and understand not what, what, what missing techniques in our inventory means in that escalation, what we can do to mitigate it um, and, and run those scenarios and be really open and honest when we have those conversations. And I think we're starting to get into that space. That's helpful. Um, Stuart, Brian, anything from, from you? Not for me. I think there's a lot of things we need to talk about in the next 15 minutes. Um, the, um, the two biggest programmes in the equipment plan at the moment are the nuclear deterrent and then GCAP. The cost of regenerating a tactical nuclear capability is huge. It um, has to take into account that we have a sub-strategic load in Trident. And so you could say that capability is already covered. The one area where it might arise is um, in a future environment where there is greater pull from the US for burden sharing and then um, mirror imaging something like the approach that the Netherlands has taken and Germany is um, uh, thinking about. Uh, just maybe one avenue, but I just, I, I don't see a, uh, a reproduction of WE177 or anything like that. Thanks, and thanks for the, the comment from uh, one of our audience that uh, the Netherlands already is uh, is fielding that capability in the uh, F-35A. Uh, okay, Sophie, let's move on. Um, so I'm going to, I've got one specifically for Jim, but then given what you just said, uh, Stuart, about um, wanting to address some more important questions, perhaps after that, I'll come to you, because rather than me pick a question, and it's not the one that you think is important, I'd be, you, can, you can see the questions, and um, so I'll sort of dev devolve responsibility for a second, and that might apply to the rest of the panel, because as you say, there are only 15 minutes left. So quickly to Jim, and then over with Chris's management to the panel. Uh, Jim, Martin Binderman asks, with the RAF input into SDR being threat-based, are you looking to enhance Typhoon as the combat air workhorse beyond, beyond the limited number of ECRS radars to meet the threat, or are, are we looking increasingly to F-35 prior to the introduction of GCAP? Oh, we're very much looking at uh, what we need to do to keep Typhoon relevant against the threat uh, and projecting when that threat will be will, will overcome fourth gen. Uh, and it, it's it's an art as much as a science in, in many ways. Uh, Typhoon through the the next decade will be uh, the stalwart of everything that we do in combat air. It, it's our mass. Um, beyond that, our commitment to GCAP would probably be for the threat based decision will, will mean we pivot over to GCAP because that is the, the, the greater capability. We need sixth gen in the forties. The the threat is showing us that. And 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 actually, just look at the behaviours of China and what they're developing, and look what Russia are developing in that time. So, so you realise they are looking at the same thing as as the USAF has definitely still got the requirement for NGAD. So, so to, to answer your question, yes is the answer. We're, we're going to keep Typhoon as relevant as long as we can, but at some point there will be a pivot to sixth gen. And, and, and during that pivot, it'll be so important that we have our NATO partners are there to help us through that transition in the Terence piece, I think. Uh, to answer that question, Sophie, you've got the phasing of fourth and fifth, which I think we're, some, we're, we're the, one of the world leaders at that moment with our Typhoon fifth gen or, or, or interoperability. We, 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 we jumped ahead as early as 2013 when we started doing those trial sets. But at some point, we will then 
move the baton and it will be the conversation of how fifth gen is our mass at a certain point and it transitions to sixth gen. And again, we've got to get into that space quite quickly so that we can lead the world. Okay, uh, thanks very much. And Sophie, I'll take uh, your advice on that. And perhaps Stuart, have you got anything there that catches your eye? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, there's uh, there's there's one about European FCAS there. I'll, I'll pretend there's one about resilience and say I, I'd like to answer that question because the the, the three things I, I just want to do. Maybe the first one's a bit of therapy, um, but it does talk to the typhoon question because when you look at the combat air strategy, there's a danger that people think it's all about FCAS when actually, and I was decom ops at the time, and you know. Typhoon was the backbone. And what I, I was concerned about was it was all about the tomorrow and not about the today. And it's not. The strategy lays out there its intent for Typhoon and Typhoon going into the future. Whether it's a thug, an assassin or whatever it is, Jim, uh, you know, it's, it's an absolutely critical. But I also wanted to pick, because when we say, you know, the nuclear deterrent and how much of the budget it takes and GCAP and how much of the budget, I want to return to uh, exports and affordability. And there's some facts in this that I think, you know, as a community, we really need to uh, bring on board. And, and again, Brian, when you were CNC and Mike Turner was running BE Systems, there was a question about how much does Typhoon cost? And uh, Mike Turner came back and said, not, not a penny. And uh, you kind of think, OK, here we are 20 odd years on. Is that true? Now, you know, of course, I would say this, wouldn't I? But Typhoon from this country was a 12 billion investment. For this country, we have got 30 billion pounds back. Every single year, we get 2 billion pounds added to our GDP. And you look, typhoon, and you know, as Brian said, you know, the word exquisite. The, the two words I hate are exquisite and sunset, you know, because you kind of look at, you know, typhoons are sunset. No, it's not, it's a thug. And we need thugs in the future. And you need size and mass matters and what you can deliver through Typhoon. This is why there's been a resurgence of Typhoon. Look at our, our, our Typhoon partners. Look at Italy and their, you know, what they have indicated. Look at what Germany and Spain have ordered. Look at what our, our partners in the Gulf are talking about. Look at Turkey. They're all looking at, actually, the kind of capabilities that Typhoon would bring. Not only does that bring money into the nation, but it also is about the capability development, keeping it relevant going forward. So I was really keen to put that typhoon in it. And Chris, at the beginning, you talked about the gap between typhoon and, and GCAP. You know, the, the typhoon capability, you know, the Germans are going to be operating into the 2060s anyway. So regardless, and if you think about us as a NATO, then you're thinking about mixed force so that fourth, fifth, sixth generation experience, which we uniquely, well, not uniquely because you have the US, I accept that, outside of the US, we have a real sort of opportunity. The second point about resilience and readiness, I think, is really important. Jim talked about agile combat employment. When I was decom ops, went out to WEPTAC in the US, and the agile combat employment was being developed in the Pacific theater. And then it was brought into the European theater. And that was one of the things, my kind of final things in uniform, I was really keen for us, not because I wanted to recreate the Harrier Force, although I did, but too late, but that kind of sense of what is a resilient force look like. And I would commend the Air Force for the work that they've done on agile combat employment. And also, and you know, this is maybe just to highlight the work in the combat air support environment, going Going forward, it's all very well having deployed assets dispersed around the world, but where's the support solution? What does that support solution? You know, the operations is no longer about the away game. It also is the home game. And therefore, you know, when you look at Coningsby and Marham and the vulnerabilities there, we need to be looking at our critical national infrastructure it, through the lens of a threat from near-peer adversary like Russia. And therefore, that sense about what resilience is has got to be more than just about where our squadrons are. It's also about our people. How are we going to generate the people for war fighting at scale? Where are they going to come from? And I wouldn't say that this is something that we have not closed as, as a country. 
You know, where are the skills? Where's the capacity? Where's the competence? Whether it's about reserve forces or what's in the regular. I think that whole force narrative that we've developed, I think, within the Royal Air Force is one that's absolutely relevant going into the future. And the final thing is that the FCAS Europe and uh, it, the, the discussion around we've already, is there room for two combat air programs? I think the absolutely critical point is about this needs to be interoperable. And this is something that from a NATO perspective that uh, we're really driving forward. The Defence Production Action Plan, which sounds really boring, but it's really strategic and really important about interoperability, about standardisation, about how we will operate combat air in the future. F-35, how do we break down some of the national silos and processes? But it's not just about F-35. NETMA, the N in NETMA stands for NATO. And when we look at European combat air, I would come back to Typhoon and then what the Typhoon force can deliver. What we need is an interoperable force there. And therefore, FCAS, SCAF, call it what you may, NGAD, absolute at the heart of it is interoperability. And yes, those conversations are taking place. Thank you for, the, for, for letting me do that, Sophie and Chris. Yeah, thank you, Stuart. Uh, Brian, anything that catches your eye you'd like to pick up? No, I just saw uh, a question on economics, um, which we may get to. I did see, and I think it's on the chat, someone saying, does the panel believe that Her, uh, Her Majesty's Treasury sees the threat as others do? I'll just tell you a very brief story. When uh, I was going with David Fisher, who was then AUS Systems, to argue for uh, funding for the, what was then the future offensive aircraft. And uh, we chose to go on Friday afternoon. We spent four hours uh, arguing to get the money. At the end, it was quite obvious the Treasury team wanted to get away. So we agreed one thing and one thing only, and that was to call it a system and not an aircraft. So uh, it was became the future offensive air system. And Osby, you were waiting in the office when uh, I came back, and uh, there were a few of you there waiting. And you looked at me and said, well, did we get it? And I said, well, it's not the future offensive aircraft. It's the FOAS. And Osby said, well, that's good. It sounds as though we're going to at least get more than one of them. Uh, OK, just... back, to, back, back to you, Jim. Uh, and, and, unless, Brian, you wanted to say something on that. I'm going to pick up on the Treasury point. The, um, we all used to say, those of us who served in the building for a long time, this is the worst long-term costing round I've ever come across, you know, year after year. Um, this is the worst backdrop for an SDR I've come across. This is worse than 2010. And it, it particularly focuses on GCAP, unfortunately. The first thing is the OBR's report of yesterday doing the projections on public sector debt, quite rightly absorbing the difficulty of surmounting the three Ds, demographics, the cost of healthcare and social care, defence, this is a dangerous world and it's not going to get any better anytime soon, and decarbonisation. So you wrap those into public expenditure and uh, they determine that it, uh, public finance is on an uh, unsustainable path. Uh, and over the next 50 years, public spending is projected to rise from 45 to 60 percent of GDP and uh, the revenue remains at 40 percent. So uh, it either comes from heavy taxation, which is probably impossible, or debt. And uh, that is not a good backdrop to be, um, to be having to look at the longer term investments that defence uh, involves. Thanks. Absolutely, Brian. Of course, the ageing population is one of the key reasons for the uh, the increase in in public expenditure, but the only thing we can say is that other nations are having the same problem. Uh, looking forward, um, Jim, anything on the question side that catches your attention before we finalise? Yeah, yes, there is, um, and it was the one on IMD being really expensive, um, and it, IMD features incredibly high on our our think list of what we're putting in towards the essays. Um, what I'd say is IMD done in a legacy format is really, really expensive. Um, but when you look at the, the, the modern tech that is coming out, there are, there are many other ways of, of cracking that nut that, that, that mean it might not have to be done in the old way. 
Uh, and we, we have a lot of awesome sensors out there. The, the Navy radars are, are eyeball friendly capable. You know, we don't have enough. Um, E7 in the system. Um, and then a series of passive. And we even have NJORD, which is uh, new radar systems, which uh, are going to mitigate wind farms. Um, the clever money and the clever question when you bring IMD and more importantly, how you fuse everything together in combat air, which is why we're here, is C2. And that doesn't have to be expensive. There are smart C2 systems um, that are air battle management system capable, so that are facing ABMS that could be developed in this country and that are being developed don't have to be expensive. They've just got to be done in a bold way that can fuse it together. And if we can fuse things together, we've answered the biggest problem of IMD, which is seeing and then deciding. Jim, thanks very much. And uh, I think I just quit, it's probably a good time to draw stamps where just about at half past. And I just would like to make a few final comments. And uh, the first is the obvious one, but Brian and others have stressed it, that we... This is all about politics, affordability, and of course the SDR is underway, and that will uh, take probably two to three years to finalise before we, we get into equipment uh, programmes and force levels. The importance, and, and Stuart Ather has been stressing this, indeed uh, so did Jim, the importance of weaponising uh, industry, uh, a defence industrial strategy, and I would say, Stuart, a defence industrial strategy, not a defence industrial wheeze because that's all we've had in the past. They've never endured. They've always been changed, uh, amended, and we've ne we need an enduring strategy. Maybe we can look forward to one in the future. Uh, the importance of integration of, uh, of industry, government, and the MOD. And something else you brought out, the skills, you know, getting the right skill levels, getting people, the people we need into industry. And that probably needs a mindset change in, the, uh, in, in academe, and that's maybe something we can think about, Sophie, in the future. I know you've done some work on this already, preparing the nation for a more technical world than the, the one we've uh, had in the past. Uh, the combat air, you know, absolutely crucial to deterrence and to war fighting. Uh, the importance of Typhoon as a bedrock of capability, but also a point that Stuart made, you know, exports and how important that exports are in the future and sustaining that capability out towards uh, GCAP. Uh, national resilience in its broadest sense. And uh, I would just remind all of us of the importance of preparing and even conditioning our people to the possibility of war. We've been so long without uh, a, a war in this country, a real war. Uh, and even when one thinks back on Afghanistan and um, what was going on in the Middle East, it was largely opaque, sadly, to a very large part of our population. Perhaps we need to be thinking about that. Uh, something else that maybe... Uh, this is one, uh, Sophie, for a future webinar, is the whole business of deterrence. Uh, back on the agenda, we've spoken about uh, tactical nuclear, but it's a lot more than that. It's now space. It's about cyber. It's about conventional capabilities as well, uh, as well as maintaining the, uh, the uh, CASD, uh, the uh, strategic nuclear capability. Uh, I'd like to conclude by Sophie thanking you and uh, Farsi and Georgie. Uh, for all of the organisation in the background, and to Stuart, Brian and Jim, uh, our uh, other panellists, and uh, for everyone who's been putting in a, a great, and I'm sorry we haven't got round to answering all of the questions, but I hope you've all enjoyed it, and let's ho hope, Sophie, this is the start of many more webinars in the future. I've certainly enjoyed it. Anything Very much, Sophie? Definitely. No, very much hope so too. Um, and we've had such so much interaction, so many questions. Uh, we, we will, as um, we've just confirmed in the chat, um, we have recorded the session and we will be putting it online available for you to watch uh, at your leisure at a later date. And I just want to add my thanks not only to the audience, um, to uh, all the panellists um, for taking their time to both uh, come and join this event now and, and the pre preparatory discussions that we've had. I really, really appreciate it. And just the interaction that we've had just shows uh, what value people uh, have taken from today. So my, my many thanks. Thanks, Sophie. And uh, I think we'll get it on the Crown Radiant Association website as well. For those people who uh, are in light blue who are listening, who are not members of the Crown Radiant Association, get onto the website and uh, join up because we are 
an organization that is uh, starting really to look at this sort of thing in, in a, a greater depth. And we want to be part of this conversation. You come and join us as well, please. And I note that Chris Maynell, our membership secretary, is on and he is standing by and able to help you should you wish to join the Cranwellian Association. I think that's probably it. So I'll hand over to Georgie to close the uh, the webinar down. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, everybody.